Um, so welcome back to another discipleship training session. Um, we are going to just pick up on the lesson of winning all spiritual battles. And I'm just going to start this class off reading the main scripture that we looked at last week, which was Romans 8 verses 26 through 31 in the easy to read version, which says this. Also, the spirit helps us. We are very weak, but the spirit helps us with our weaknesses. We don't know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself speaks to God for us. He begs God for us, speaking to him with feelings too deep for words. God already knows our deepest thoughts. He understands what the spirit is saying because the spirit speaks for his people in the way that agrees with what God wants. We know that in everything God works for the good of those who love him. These are the people God chose because that was his plan. God knew them before he made the world and he decided that they would be like his son. Then Jesus would be the firstborn of many brothers and sisters. God planned for them to be like his son. He chose them and made them right with him. And after he made them right, he gave them glory. So I did a, a very uh, descriptive breakdown of that scripture last week. So you can listen to that lesson. But in this, we are seeing that when we pray with tongues, when we pray in the Holy Spirit, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's making intercession for us, um, which becomes very important when we're talking about winning all spiritual battles. Um, the Holy Spirit understands the mind of God and he speaks for us as we're praying with tongues in a way that is causing us to pray what agrees with what God wants. That is why when we are praying with tongues, we are praying the perfect prayer and that we're not praying amiss or asking for anything that is outside the will of God or outside of what God wants. The Holy Spirit within our spirit gives us the words to speak and we're praying in a way that agrees with what God wants and making sure that you know, he's leading us and we're praying for things that's going to lead us to this place where God can work all things to the good of those that love him, those that are obedient to him. And the ultimate goal is for us to look like his son, that we should be like Christ and that he chose us. He made us right. And he also gave us glory. So as I stated last week, there is no reason why any saint should be losing any battles. We have the power of God. We have the ability to have the, the Holy Spirit intercede for us on our behalf as we pray with tongues to pray in a way that agrees with God. God chose us. He is making us to look like his son. He made us right with him and he gave us glory. Satan doesn't have any of those things. Principalities don't have any of those things. The fallen angels, the demons, they don't have any of those things. Agents of Satan, who are human beings that are witches, that are wizards, that are sorcerers, they don't have any of those things. So there's no reason why they should be getting the victory over us in battles. Ultimately, the one who should win the battle when it comes to the end is the saint. And if the saint is not winning that battle, there are some issues with that saint. And so that is what we've been looking at so far is how do we win all spiritual battles? Because that is God's expectation. He's not down here. The expectation is that we win all the battles that come our way. Not that we fumble through those battles, losing those battles. Not that we quit in the middle of that battle. Not that we become weak in those battles uh, and just lay down, become paralyzed, cry and say, woe is me those things are unacceptable. So moving on with the new material today, because we talked a lot about consecration on last week. Um, so I just want to conclude saying another thing about consecration, and then we'll start moving into um, different parts of the material today. So again, consecrate yourself, then go before God in prayer. So that becomes very important, separating yourself, 
and we define consecration again as um, setting, setting yourself apart, being purified from everything that is of the world. Not some things, everything. So we need to be consecrating ourselves, especially when, and I'm specifically talking about, of course we know we need to live consecrated lives, but I'm talking specifically there's a battle at your doorstep and you need to know what you need to do to win this battle. You need to make sure the first thing you do is consecrate yourself. Set yourself apart, be purified, be separated from everything of the world because the enemy is of the world. And that fight that is coming to your doorstep, if you are a part of the world, you can't win and defeat Satan using his playbook. You gotta come completely out of his playbook and go into only the Lord's play playbook. And you have to be completely separated from everything of the world. So if you're not willing to do that, that's why you're not going to be successful. And nobody can help you win this war. There's, th there's only things that you can do because that's your part to do. And God's going to do his part. But it doesn't matter how many people you have pray for you, intercede for you, whatever. If you're not doing the things that we're going to be looking at in this lesson, you're not going to win those battles. Okay. So, consecrate yourself. Then go before the Lord and pray. And an example of something that you can pray, because you want to make sure as we get to this next part of the lesson, this will bring you into this next part of the lesson that I'm getting ready to go to if that's needed. So one thing you want to pray as you go before God is, Father, I am here. Judge me. My thoughts, motives, actions. Test me, Lord. Father, reveal to me your guidance, authority, and will in this situation that I may know your will and submit to your will. So I stated that prayer last week, but I'll state it again. And if I need to repeat it, if anyone's writing that, just let me know and I can repeat it again after I say it this time. So Father, I am here. Judge me, my thoughts, motives, and actions. Test me, Lord. Father, reveal to me your guidance, authority, and will in this situation that I may know your will and submit to it. Because what you want to do is make sure you're putting yourself in a position to hear from God as you're in this place of consecration. Are there things that you need to repent of? Are there things that need to be dealt with? Because if those things go undealt with, those are going to be hindrances for you to win the battle that you are currently engaged in. So when you do this, God, through his Holy Spirit, will advocate for you with words that cannot be expressed with your mouth because you have allowed the Holy Spirit to convict you of any wrongs in your life and guide you into all truth. So again, that is why the praying with the, in the spirit or praying with tongues becomes very important because that is a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection with God. And as you're praying these prayers with your native language and then go into tongues, God can start to convict you of things that, you know, you need to be convicted of things or reveal things to you and lead you in the truth and to guide you. So the Holy Spirit will bring conviction where it is needed in your life and bring you to a place of deep repentance if it is needed. So, um, okay, Carly, so which one you want me to repeat? The prayer? I'm thinking. Yes, the okay, prayer. Sure. Okay. So, Father, I am here. <clears throat> so, Father, I am here. Judge me. My thoughts. motives and actions. Thanks, Charlie. Test me, Lord. Father, reveal to me 
your guidance, authority, and will in this situation. That I may know your will and submit to it in this situation. Yeah. Okay. So Charlene has it in the chat. So just grab it there. Thanks, Charlene. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. <laughs> <laughs> Working together. All right. Uh, okay. So now let's talk about brokenness and repentance because this becomes crucial as it relates to being able to win all spiritual battles. So brokenness and repentance is one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare. And we're gonna understand why as we go through this lesson. So bro brokenness and repentance is one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare. So brokenness is when you become um, sensitive to the fact that you're in sin or have sin in your life and you're humbling yourself before God. So you're broken. Someone who is not broken, that's why they continue to operate in sin or think that, you know, well, God's grace is just going to cover that. You're not broken because you just think that you can keep doing what you want to do and that you got this, um, like this, this car you can keep playing to just gloss over the fact that you're not living a right lifestyle. So when you're broken, you have that's what a contract heart is. You're broken, you're you're sorry for your sin, you're disgusted with that sin. Um there's another word I think I'm trying to think of. Um but like you 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 have come to this place where you see the need for you to have to have a savior um and to turn from that sin and not want to continue to operate in it. So, um, I think you like, you regret, you're regretful for your actions and stuff like that too. So, and, um, we're kind of like in this place in society where people don't regret the sins that they operate in. Um, and they're completely fine with it. So brokenness and repentance is one of the highest forms of spiritual warfare. Repentance, renouncing sin, and what renouncing means is, just give another definition, renouncing means to voluntarily give up sin. It is also giving up sin by a formal declaration. So you're formally declaring, you know, I'm turning my back on sin, I'm going to God. But also there's the action that goes along with the declaration of you're voluntarily giving it up. Everyone's not voluntarily giving up sin. And that's because they're not in this place of brokenness. So repentance, renouncing sin, condemning sin, breaking free from sin, and seeking cleansing from sin is highly important to win battles. And that's why we can't have this mindset, oh, I'm human, I'm gonna have some sin in my life then you're going to be losing battles because it's unacceptable. That's an unacceptable mindset. The expectation is for us to come out of sin, not to be in sin, not to think there's going to be some sin in some area of my life. Come out of sin is the expectation. So, and when you really start to understand the spirit realm and how things work, that mindset becomes foolishness to think that it is okay to have some sin or we're going to have some sin in our life because you can't be victorious. That's why so many people aren't being victorious. That's the best way I can put that because what I hear sometimes from people is, well, maybe this is the way life is supposed to look because when I look at this church and when I look at this pastor, when I look at this bitch, bishop, when I look at this prophet, you know, because they're losing in life, you know, maybe that's just, you know, how things go. No, they're losing in life because they're not dealing with this area of brokenness, repentance, conse consecration. These things become very, very, very essential when you want to live a life where you're actually thriving in the spirit realm and being able to walk in the things that God has given us authority to walk in. You can't walk in those things 
if there isn't brokenness in you, if there isn't repentance in you, if there isn't consecration there. So, um, when you turn to the Lord in repentance, which is to turn away from sin and to turn to God, the Lord will pardon your sins and then he will turn against your enemies to fight them. But he can't fight your enemies if you participating in sin with your enemies because you're not the enemy of God. So we got to see that sin makes us an enemy to God. And God is not going to step in and assist in fighting our enemy when we're being an enemy to God by having sin in our life. So I'm going to just pause and let that sink in. And let me know if there's any thoughts, questions, or comments. Okay. And let me actually go here to, to validate what I just said. Um, let me check the scripture first before I call it out. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to go to... Romans chapter 8 verses 5 through 7 and I'm going to read it in the New King James Version. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, meaning your carnal nature. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Meaning when you think according to a carnal mindset, that makes you an enemy against God. A carnal mindset is, is an enemy against God for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So that is why coming out of sin that is why having a mindset see when you operate from a spiritual mindset having sin in your life is not acceptable but when you operate from a carnal mindset you know having some sin in your life well that's acceptable that mindset is an enemy against God which is going to cause you to have some sin in your life which is going to cause God not to be able to to come in and fight that battle with you like you need him to because you, as Satan and the agents of Satan and the kingdom of darkness is fighting you being your enemy you're joined with them fighting God because you're an enemy based on your mindset and based on the things that are in your life so we got to make sure that that's not there and that's why again as I was fighting that battle there were certain mindsets coming to my mind of you know do this revengeful thing or do this spiteful thing and the Lord kept telling me no why was that because God is like, if you step out of line, I can no longer help you, Tremiko. I can't. And that he's saying that to everybody. I can't help you, Rydasia. I can't help you, Andrew. I can't help you, Trina. I can't help you, Carlisa. I can't help you. I can't help you. And people would always say to me as I would talk to them, um, like coworkers and stuff like that, they're just like, man, I don't know if I could have handled that the way you did. And I was even talking to my mom yesterday because we were all together, just hanging out, having a barbecue. And she was just like, I'm really well pleased with the way you handled that whole situation. She was like, you know, I don't know if I could have done it to the degree you did that. And that's where we have to get to this place of, that's where we get stretched. That's the best thing I can do. You, you don't know what you're capable of until the situation arrives. And you don't develop in godly character until that God until it's challenged. And that two-year ordeal, which I'm sure there's more stuff coming in life, it comes to challenge. And I'll get to that later in this lesson. The enemy is going to come to provoke you and challenge you in those ways. And you have to rise to the occasion of having a spiritual mindset and doing things God's way and not moving over into this place of sin and doing things a carnal way or a different way or not completely cleansing your life of whatever sins may be there as you start to enter this battle. You are going to lose. 
And that is why we see so many losers in what we call church. They're not doing these things. And the more and more I talk to people, the more and more I hear, oh, I don't think I can do that. Well, that's why your life looks the way it looks, because what I'm doing is not impossible. And people are trying to make it seem like my lifestyle is so impossible. Well, then don't prosper, because my, my whole thing is I'm a prosper in life. And that's my job, and that's why God has me here, to teach people how to. So it's on everybody to make that decision whether you're going to follow his ways of what he's having me teach and other people in the earth to teach, or you're going to say that's unachievable and then you're going to lose. But it's not going to matter how many people pray and intercede for you. I don't care how many intercessors you go to. It's not going to help if you don't do your part. So let me pause and see if there are any thoughts, questions, or comments before I keep going and look at more scripture. So there, if you haven't gotten there yet, you will get there where you are severely challenged in your morals, in your values that all should stem from God and his word. And are you going to keep to that or are you going to allow the situation cause you to buckle and fold and compromise? Because you're over when that happens. Um, okay. So I'm going to go to Isaiah 55 and read verses 6 through 7 in the New King James Version. So Isaiah 55 verses 6 through 7 in the New King James Version. This says, seek the Lord while he may be found. We all got to do that. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked, and the wicked is the one, the person living in iniquity, meaning you're living in a lifestyle where you're doing things contrary to God's way. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And to forsake means to give up, quit, leave entirely, abandon. So when it said, let the wicked forsake his way, you have to entirely leave your way of doing things entirely leave your way of thinking not partially entirely and so if we're not entirely thinking what God says saying what God says and do what God said you have not abandoned sin you haven't and I thought that that was really key when I saw that to leave entirely. That leaves no room for leaving anything behind. So it says, and the unrighteous man has thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. That's repentance. And he will have mercy. God will have mercy on him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. So when we get to this place of brokenness and repentance, we see God will have mercy and pardon. And because of that, he can enter the battle with us. But if not, he can't show us mercy. He can't part in that sin, nor can he enter into the battle with us. And if we don't have God with us in battle, we are going to lose because we're fighting spiritual beings and we don't compare to a spiritual being. They're greater than a human being. The only thing that makes us great is the power of God in us. Okay. So repentance involves voluntarily giving up your method of thinking and leaving entirely the ways in which you operate your habits and way of life in order to return to God and think thoughts in agreement with his word and operate according to his way of life. So I'm going to say that one more time. Repentance involves voluntarily. And I love that word, voluntary. Because nobody's forcing you to do this. And God's not going to make you do this. And again, that's why so many people fail. And the way God has kind of likened this in my head is when you were in like elementary, junior high, Maybe not so much high school, but sometimes high school, 
your teachers made you do certain things or your parents made you go to school and get there. But when you went away to college or university, it was all on you at that point, whether you got up, whether you left your dorm, whether you left your apartment and went to campus, made it to class on time, the teachers, they get paid. The professors, they don't care whether you study, whether you pass the exam, whether you show up for the exam, whether you pass in the homework, they could care less because they still get a check. So it's all on you once you reach university level, co college level, to make sure you start to learn discipline, to make sure you become responsible and that you're not partying all the time and missing classes and missing assignments and not studying for tests and X, Y, Z. If you need to get it with a study group, nobody's putting that together for you. The students in the class got to be independent and responsible for going to other students and say, hey, you want to form a study group? Because I need to pass this test and I'm going to need help. Do you need help? If they don't do that, if the students in and of themselves aren't responsible for initiating things, that's the great word there. They have to initiate it because nobody cares to initiate it for you at university level and college level. And that is this life that we live with God. We have to voluntarily do the things that he says in his word. We have to initiate operating in a godly mindset and godly speech and godly behavior. Nobody is going to pump and prime you and make you do those things. It's all voluntary. So your victory is voluntary and your defeat is voluntary. It's all on us. So repentance involves voluntarily giving up your method of thinking and leaving entirely the ways in which you operate, your habits, and way of life in order to return to God and think thoughts in agreement with his word and operate according to his way of life. So I'll pause and see if there are any thoughts, questions, or comments on that before I keep going. Okay. So from James Kowalia's experience in operating in the kingdom of darkness, and just vastly operating in the spirit world. He advised, and you know, nobody can put like actual percentages, but if he said if he was to give it a percentage, he advised that 80% of spiritual warfare will be won through repentance. And I'm gonna go through why. So if repentance is not in a person's life, that makes up, according from his vantage point of what he was able to see as an operative going against the church, 80%, that's most of it. So if you don't have repentance in your life, you have lost. And again, that's why I go back. That is why we see so many people losing in life that say that they are saints. Repentance is really not there in their life. And I have been in leadership around pastors, around ministers, around intercessors, around a lot of different types of whatever classifications or titles you want to give people, the majority of these people did not live repentant lives. It was a show. They had a form of godliness. And I cannot stress that enough. Uh, and, and that's why it, in a sense, breaks my heart that as people have been exposed recently, whether they're in God's kingdom or whether they're just famous people in the world and people are like, oh my God, they really did those things? These people are out here being fake. And, and a lot of people are being fooled into thinking people are upright, upstanding citizens when they truly are not. They're monsters or they're wicked or they're living in iniquity. And so many people are shocked by this stuff and it's just like the majority of people are not doing what God said. The majority of people are not living repentant lives. And again, we should be able to see that through the fruit of someone's life. So, um, and I'm talking according to spiritual things. I'm not talking about do they have a Rolls Royce, a Lexus, a mansion. That's not what I'm talking about when I say we should see it through the fruit. 
Because that's what a lot of people look at, the material possessions, and think, oh, they, they good with God, they right with God. But in actuality, they are not. Okay, so let's keep going forth. So repentance disarms the demons and the kingdom of darkness because the power of demons and the power of darkness is in sin. And that's what we have to understand. If they can get you to operate in sin, they're like 80% there of winning this whole battle. Their strength is in getting people to operate in sin. That is the whole job of an agent of Satan, is to get people to operate in sin. So, when a human being repents, when a human being repents, it disarms the kingdom of darkness and demons because that is their strong tower is to get people to operate in sin. The sin of the people, the sin of the community, and the sin of the land is what empowers demons, is what empowers the kingdom of darkness. So let me say that again. The sin of the people, the sin of the community, the sin of the land is what empowers demons. And that's why we see principalities who give orders to the demons, as I'm teaching in war book, is to promote an agenda of different kinds of sins to be prevalent in a region, in a territory, in a community, in a family, because that is their strong tower. So the more people sin, the more the demonic spirits get stronger. Every time repentance happens, it weakens the demons. It weakens the kingdom of darkness. And this is why you hear God say so much. Come out of sin. Sin no more. Least, least a worse thing come upon you. Change your mindset. Come to me so that sin will no longer have dominion over you. Why is he constantly preaching come out of sin? Because this is what God understands. And this is what a lot of human beings don't understand. And that's why they think some sin is okay in your life when it's really not. Or being a part of the world to a small degree. Uh, it's okay. And it's not. When you have the enemy in you, you can't defeat the enemy. And that is what God is showing me more and more and more and more. And it's really reframing and recalibrating my mindset to the things that I participate in, to the things that I indulge in, to the things that I use as entertainment. Because if I wanna be victorious, and if I wanna operate in great levels of authority, if I want the measure of anointing that I'm flowing in to be great, I can't have worldly things a part of me. And that's just my desire. And that is the desire, and that is, and that, let me not just put that on me. That is what God wants for everybody. Because when it goes back to say, in Romans 8, when we looked at that, that his purpose and plan is for us to look like his son, Jesus Christ had none of the world in him. So that is the desire of God. And because I desire the things of God, that's why that's my desire. That's the best way I can put that. Because it's not just a me thing. This is what God's expectation is for every single one of us. Um, so before I keep going forward, any thoughts, questions, or comments so far on that? Okay. So still continue with, with repentance. When you move, when you remove, I'm sorry, when you remove sin through repentance, the demons and the kingdom of darkness are powerless because every sin is basically a sacrifice to the devil and it gives the kingdom of darkness more power. That's why sin is not okay. <clears throat> That's why turning a blind eye to sin is not okay. That's not why blushing at sin is okay. It's like a sacrifice to the devil because sin is his jam. That's what he get down on. That's what empowers him. That's what causes his kingdom to thrive. 
that is what he's currently doing against God and the kingdom of God. He is in opposition to God, which means he lives in sin. His whole kingdom is based and ruled in sin. So if sin is in us and in our lives, we have that of the devil within us. Adriana. So just making sure I have a good understanding that so the less we sin, the more we repent, um, the more the world is like the communities, the churches, the and just within the world repent and sin not, the less power the enemy have over anything, which that is a way to break principalities down and... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Their strength is in sin. If the sin is removed, there's nothing they can do. And I'm going to go back to the example that we talked about so many times when I teach with Balak and Balaam. Balaam could not curse Israel. And it said why? There was no iniquity found in Israel. <clears throat> but as soon as Balaam figured out a way to trick them into sinning and having sex with the Moabite women and then falling down and worshiping and serving, Law, the gods of Moab, sin entered into Israel and they fell. That opened the door for the enemy to have power because the enemy had no power. The enemy can stand across the street or come on the same side of the street you own and bark in your face all he wants. But as long as there's no sin in your life, there's nothing that the kingdom of darkness and Satan can do. They, they just gonna keep barking. But as soon as you allow the provoking of the enemy the enemy challenging you to move into a place of sin that's when that bark gonna turn into a bite and you're gonna feel it that's the best way i can put that so the thing is we constantly have different avenues of enticement or provoking coming at us maybe on a daily basis to get you to operate in some type of sin. Because there are millions, probably billions, of different ways to sin. And they got all of that at their disposal to try to come against you. And that's why we have to be so close to God. Meditating day and night in his word to make sure our mind is protected, our thoughts are protected. To make sure we also remember the ways of God so when we are provoked and when we are challenged, we know, oh, the word said not to do that. I can't do that. Oh, the word told me to do this. So I better do this in this situation. But you can't do that if we're not doing what he told us to do. And so the more and more I start to learn spiritual things, the more and more why God says what he says in his word makes sense to me. And why having a mindset that deviates from what God says is wrong and will cause you to fall and fail. So, yes. Does that help, Adriana? Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So every time you walk in sin, again, it is a sacrifice to the devil. And oftentimes, most sins end up in covenants that give the devil legal rights over a family, over a life, and even over a church. So again, we gotta understand that most times these sins are causing us to initiate covenants with the kingdom of darkness, whether we realize that or not. So another thing that James Kowali advised based on his experience of what he saw during his time of serving Satan is that worship of God makes up about another 10% of how spiritual battles are won. So you got repentance being the greater majority, 80%. So if you can get that down, you like 80% there. Another 10% is gonna be our worship of God. And that's where I'm gonna really start to unpack and break a lot of things down and try to take it by chunks, but it makes up about 10% of how spiritual battles are won. So worship involves more than just singing songs to the Lord. Because a lot of times, that's where people's mind go, worship. Let me raise my hands, 
and say something great to God. Worship is a lifestyle of submission to God through obedience to God and his word. Now get this, this is very important. So worship is a lifestyle of submission to God through obedience to God and his word, which determines the measure of the anointing you wear and operate in. Before I go forward and say the other important parts of this, anointing is basically the power of God that we operate in. We get that power through the Holy Spirit. So when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we become anointed. But that doesn't mean that you operate in great measures of anointing. No, 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 no. Because while we saw Jesus healing the sick, casting demons out, raising the dead, a lot of us are baptized in the Holy Spirit and a lot of us have not even done that. Or we're not doing it consistently. Why is that? Because there's measures to this. And it matters what your lifestyle looks like. It matters if you live a repentant lifestyle. All of this, y'all, matters. So the devil ain't scared because somebody filled with the Holy Spirit and gonna say in, in, a, in warfare and in battle, I'm baptized and Holy Ghost filled. He gonna be like, yeah, but your measure of anointing is completely low, so that doesn't matter. That don't scare him, y'all. The things that we think scare the kingdom of darkness, it don't. Because there's always measures to stuff. So, your lifestyle of worship, which is submission to God through obedience to God and his word, determines the measure of the anointing you wear and operate in. Additionally, worship involves your attitude and the atmosphere in which you allow yourself to live and dwell. Say that one more time and then I'm gonna start breaking these three parts down. So your worship determines the measure of anointing you wear and operate in Worship also involves your attitude and the atmosphere in which you allow yourself to live and dwell. Let me know if I need to repeat anything for anyone taking notes before I go forward. I'll pause. Uh, one more time, please. Sure. Worship is a lifestyle of submission to God. So worship is a lifestyle of submission to God through obedience To God and His Word, comma, which determines the measure of the anointing, which is the power of God. It determines the measure of the anointing. It determines the measure of the anointing you wear and operate in, period. Additionally, worship involves your attitude and the atmosphere in which you allow yourself to live and dwell. So additionally, worship involves your attitude and the atmosphere in which you 
allow yourself to live and dwell. And let me know if I need to repeat it some more. Worship, so I'm gonna read the whole thing. So worship makes up about 10% of how spiritual battles are won. Worship involves more than just singing songs to the Lord. Worship is a lifestyle of submission to God through obedience to God and his word, which determines the measure of the anointing you wear and operate in. Additionally, worship involves your attitude and the atmosphere in which you allow yourself to live and dwell. So what I'm gonna be breaking down in just a moment about worship is the anointing, the attitude, and the atmosphere. That becomes very important. And when we go through this, we gonna see not a lot of people are worshiping God. So let me know if I need to repeat some more for anyone taking notes. It's just, um, I'm like seeing a pattern of, of like everything that's being taught, which is obedience, because it's like, it's, it all leads to just being obedient, like worship, sounds like it's like in simplified terms, be yeah. obedient, uh -huh. loving Jesus, be obedient, win wars, be obedient. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it's just all like, you just need to be obedient. Yeah. And it's just. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it, 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 it's simple, but then when people like, and that's why I love this lesson because it really starts to break down different components because then people are in their mind like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And it's just like, like you said, just obey. So, I don't know. I guess that becomes too big for them. They need to, like, for you to dissect it into everything. Um, Adriana. And I see, like, just to add to uh, what Rajasia was saying, being obedient without knowing, trusting, trusting and being obedient, because you may not understand why God said what he said, like, why not to watch that? Why not to hang with this person? Why not? And you're like, but you don't physically, and that's that living in the physical versus spiritual, um, see why, but just trusting him and knowing that he's almighty, that he's all pow powerful, he has your best interest, and do what it is he said, that obedience part. Exactly. <laughs> and he will reveal to you when it's time or what have you, but just trust and obey. Exactly. And I wanna say too, another thing about battle is that you can't move too fast or too slow with your moves. You gotta move when God say to move. And so that's another thing, because sometimes people are like, well, this is happening and, and, and the heat is really being turned out. So I'm gonna just go ahead and do this. And the Lord didn't tell you to do that. All right, you about to mess up. Or he told you to do it, but you've been getting hit with so many punches. You're just like, man, I'm not even about to do that right now. You procrastinate. All right, not even messed up. Timing is a factor when it comes to, to war and battle. So y'all, the, the obedience, the anointing, the attitude, the atmosphere, we gonna see how this plays a crucial role if you win or not. And again, I think this is really crucial, but again, according to what Kowali said, this is 10%. Because the 80% is really the repentance piece. And that's the piece a lot of people struggle with. It's coming out of sin, having this mindset. And it's a shame that that is the way that it is, but Satan is really good at his job, and that is the way it is for a lot of people. They struggle with truly repenting. But okay, so let's talk about this. So worship is very important since it affects your anointing, your attitude, <clears throat> and atmosphere. So I'm gonna start with the first one, the anointing. How does worship affect your anointing? So. The anointing, your measure of submission to God is the measure of anointing God will release for you to operate in. And 
the more and more I hear this, it takes me back to the word God gave Trey. To the measure you put in, that's the measure you getting out. And that's what everything, y'all. And it's like the Lord just keeps bringing that word he gave Trey back to me. And I keep seeing it and seeing it and seeing it. The measure that you put in is the measure you getting out. So the measure of your submission to God. Is the, is the measure of the anointing God will release for you to operate in. It's the measure of the power he's going to release for you to operate in. Because he's not going to release this dynamite power to someone who could go out and just do stupid, crazy things. That can put everybody at risk. God is a responsible father. He's not going to do that. So he's going to look at the measure you submitted. That's the measure of anointing you're going to be able to exercise in. And that's in warfare, that's in healing, that's in maybe raising the dead, that's, that's in a whole lot of different areas of the good works. Because he said greater works you will do than what I did. Do we pervasively see greater works happening in the church? No, we don't. There's a reason for that. And it's not because God is a liar. It's a whole lot of people not submitting to God. And so he says, well then, I'm not going to increase that measure of anointing. It's not even about to happen. So your measure of submission to God is the measure of anointing or power of God that he will release for you to operate in. Your measure of submission to God depends on how much you fear God, meaning how much you reverence God. And reverence is an attitude of deep respect for God. So the measure of how much you deeply respect God, that is going to determine the measure you submit to God. And if the respect level isn't there the way that it needs to be, then that submission to God is not going to be there the way that it needs to be. That's how that works. So if a person has a submission problem, they have a respect problem with God, a fearing him. Therefore, the fear or reverence or deep respect of God in you produces submission to God. And out of submission, the anointing flows through you. So I, I know that's a lot. I'm going to repeat that a few times because I know that got to sink in. I had time to eat this up and I know I, I need to give you all the time too. So. Your measure of submission to God is going to depend on how much you deeply respect God, you reverence God. So that's what we all got to check. What is my respect level of God look like? And, and don't lie to yourself. Stay paused. Okay. <laughs> and just repeat the first phrase. Okay, I'm going to just keep repeating that one. Okay. Your measure of submission to God depends on how much you reverence God or deeply respect God. Your measure of submission to God depends on the measure of your reverence for God. Can we um, define, like, look up the definitions of reverence and respect? So reverence is an attitude of deep respect. You want me to look at respect? Okay. I'll share it on the screen once I can do that. Why isn't this coming up? Okay. So, respect. A particular detail or point. That's not it. Relation or reference. Okay, here we go. Number three, esteem for a sense of worth or excellence of a person, a personal quality or ability. Let me see if this is it. Or something considered as a manifestation of a personal quality or ability, difference to a right, privilege, privilege, position, or some or something considered to have certain rights. The condition of being esteemed or honored. Yeah, so I will go with number five. The condition of being esteemed or honored. So like, I greatly admire you. I greatly esteem you. I exalt you. Like, 
is he elevated in your life? Or is he just kind of like down here, you think you y'all like neck and neck, or you a little bit above him, or I don't have that much respect for you, I kind of disdain you, I kind of hate you. Like, when you greatly homage someone, you bow down to them. And it's just like, whatever you say, that's respect. And then I can put up here, Reverence, a feeling or attitude of deep respect, tinged with awe, veneration. That's the esteem. Like, I'm in awe of you. Oh my God. I like, I so respect you. I'll do whatever you say. And that's how these cult leaders get people to do whatever, because they, they esteem them so much. Oh, he said it. He said, let's drink this Kool Aid with poison in it. He's. He said, let's get the jumpsuit. <laughs> okay. Okay. Like he pushed the deficit. Okay, I'm trying to see if there was something else here real quick. I think I got. I feel like just, you know, having a really good understanding of respect then you can truly answer the question. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, so did that take oh. me to this? Okay, let me go here. Let me go here. Esteem, I can just type it in. Esteem, to regard highly or favorably. And there's the admiration there, as I talked about. So you highly regard this person. They have a high level of favor in your life. You're in awe of them. Okay. Okay. Good understanding now. Like you truly, let me say this. The, the level that you value them their word, their opinion, it outnumbers anything else. It, it ranks high above everything. Respect means my level of value for you, the way I um, regard you, um, the doors in my life that I open to you, it, you got it. But there's, there's nothing anybody can do to like be above you. Like You're that one. If that makes sense. So good. Okay. So let's go back. The measure of your submission to God depends on how much you reverence God, have a deep respect for God, highly value God, how much you admire God. And if your measure is little, your submission is going to be little. If your measure of reverence in God is medium, your submission is going to be medium. If your level of reverence to God is high, you're going to highly submit to him. If your reverence for him is great, you're going to greatly submit to him. There's measures. It's not just, I do it, and that's, it's, just, it's not just one measure. And I think that's the mistake we all make is to think, hey, if I do it, I did it. But the question is, to what measure did you do it? I don't really hear messages talking about that. And the more I walk with God, the more I'm learning. Yeah, you did it, but your measure is so low. You need to increase that. Just like we can pray for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour, two hours. It's measures. What measure are you doing it in? So your measure of submission to God depends on how much or your measure of reverence of God. Therefore, the submission, I'm sorry, therefore, the reverence of God in you produces submission to God. So your reverence for God is what is going to produce submission to God. And out of submission, the anointing will flow. It's not fun. I'll be vulnerable. Oh, okay. And we're gonna pause, give our day to the floor. It's just like, <clears throat> I'm gonna just get pulled out of I'm trying to speak up. Sorry. Um, I just heard it tearing up because like, 
I mean, I'm gonna try to keep it somewhere else so it makes sense because I know I'm feeling emotional or whatever. But like truly understanding that this specific phrase is showing me that like I don't have as much respect for God as I thought I did. Mm -hmm. Because it's like when I'm, I've been learning all these years and it's like I'm, I'm learning this stuff and I know it's in the Bible and I know like I want to put God first so I'm doing it because I want to put him first. But then when it comes to like that specific phrase of like my obedience will be in direct relation with how much I respect him. I think like for the most part, especially in my weakest area of life, my obedience has been from a point of like, well, I know that's what he says, so I want to do it, but not a like, you know what, Lord, you said it, I want to do it, I respect you, I admire you, you're above everything else, like forget what everybody else says, and it's not there. Yeah. And it's like kind of heartbreaking because mm -hmm. he deserves way more, you know? Yeah. No, thank you for the transparency. I think we all get to a place in life where we come to that realization and thank God, God allows messages like this to go forth because he knows everybody ain't where they need to be in their respect for him. And like I've been, well everybody knows this so I just opened up, but I've been really struggling with my doula business and like I know that's what God wants for me and I've been trying to figure out like why am I struggling so hard and it's like I don't respect him in that area. Of life, like I don't, I'm not putting my trust in him. His word above everything else is not first for me in that area, and I just I'm like finally I have the answer, which is really great, and you know not to work towards. I was really like I'm struggling so hard. I'm like Lord, I want to listen to you in this area so 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 much, but I'm like why is it so hard for me to truly just do what you said? Like you gave me these demands. Why am I struggling so hard to do them? Like, I know that Satan is against me, but like, yeah, I feel like it was way more than that. And I mean, yeah. this really answers it for me. Well, that's good. I'm glad you got your answer. Um, and yeah, I mean, and let me say this before I get to Carlisa, that's a journey, right? It, that you have to now take. So now God gave you the word, you can see it in your personal life, and hopefully all of us, right, are doing some reflection. I know a few years ago I was at a place where the Lord got to me and was like, yeah, your level of respect for me is not where it needs to be. And once I realized that, it is, it's heartbreaking, like, dang, like, I don't esteem you the way you deserve to be esteemed. And I got still ways to go of making sure I esteem him the way that I need to, but man, you start out at a level of maybe one or two in esteeming God. And he like, oh, yeah, we're going to have to increase that. And it directly, in, like you see, it directly impacts the level of submission, but it also directly impacts the manifestation of what we see in our life. Because God not going to budge. There is a system. And he ain't budging from that system. Uh, Carlisa. I, you know, I and I learned, you know, through the years, to keep my focus on God yeah. and everything, because we have so much that's going on around us and, and we have to be mindful of we're in the world, but we're not of it. So whatever situation that comes, that comes our way, God wants us to continue to just love on him and focus on him. And a lot of times we get, and I can speak for me, we get caught up on other things and then we don't realize that God loves how much he loves us. We don't hear, have the fear of God because we focusing on the wrong thing. But he said, focus on me, love on me, fear me, not the situation that you're going through. And I think that even listening to this and listening to Rhodesia, I felt the same way. You know, it's like, wow, I don't, do I really reverence God like that? Do I really, keep him ahead of my life? Do I really look at him like that? You know, and it's something to really think about because he he is number one. He is our number one focus and we have to learn to be content where we are and just focus on him because he'll do the rest when in his timing. Yeah. So thank you, Carlisa, for that. It's very, very mm -hmm. important, right? That we all do a self-examination and see where we are with reverence in God. Do we highly respect him? Do we have high regard for him? Does he have a high level of favor in our life? Do we highly value him? Is he supreme? Does he come before everything and everyone? 
Um, and, and all of this is going to relate to where we're going in this lesson, right? Because we're going to start talking about integrity and different things like that and character. All of that gets baked in to your level, to your measure of reverence for God. It's crucial. It's very crucial. So thank you for having me slow down to make sure we all get to digest this. Um, Adriana. I just wanted to say that for our days, you're not alone because as I'm learning as well and I'm speaking and I'm asking the Lord, like um, the prayer that Nico stated, like check us first, you know, have I repented? Have I truly repented? Um, am I doing what God is telling me to do in the manner in which he is telling me to do it in? It's like I'm checking myself and I'm like, ooh, ooh. Ouch, ouch, oh, and where is my level of respect for God? If I say I have respect for God, that means, in all honesty, I should move when he say move, how he say move, and only really be reliant on him. And am I doing that? No, I'm not. And just like how you feel about your business, like God gave it to you, he told you to do, he told you when to move, but it seems like it's just, well, I'm gonna have to say it's like maybe a spiritual thing because I don't see where it's going wrong in the in the physical atmosphere that it just like try to pull you and tug you away from doing that thing and it's like we just gotta continue to pray and ask God for strength and to pray against those things spiritually so that we can try to move forward the way God told us to move forward. Um, and then um, I want to just piggyback off what Radesia is talking about, what Ann, um, Adriana just mentioned. Um, don't only look at this from a perspective of like major sins, uh, well, yeah, like fornication and lying, you know, things that are abominations to God. Simple things, as you guys are talking about. He told me to do X, Y, Z towards my business, or he told me to do X, Y, Z in ministry, or he told me to do X, Y, Z today, and you didn't do it. There's a problem in your level of respect for him. Because when he says to do something, it really, the best way I can put it, you should be hopping to it like, okay, yes, sir, let me get it done. But that's not everybody's mindset. People's mindset, oh, God is a God of love and grace. He'll understand if I procrastinate on this. And God's looking the whole time and he's like, you don't respect me enough. That's what he's saying, y'all. So, and that's why he has this lesson going forward. It's not, a, it's not something we should brush aside or under the rug or it'll be okay or they're there. God is saying it's not okay. He's saying, I'm a God. There's nobody before me. There's nobody beside me. There's nobody like me. I became a human being. I died for you. I did all these different things. Respect me. You know how they say in the world, put some respect on my name. He's saying right now to all of us, put some respect on my name and do it. And so that's going to be a journey for you to figure out what, what are the areas in your life causing you not to. And each one of us are going to have to do our due diligence daily to grow that level of respect. Yes. Yeah, like for me, it was um, like whenever he tells me to do something or I know I'm supposed to be doing something, I was just like, like I'm struggling so hard with this, and, and I've, you know, of course, experienced fight on Satan's behalf where he's like, you know, wants to stop me. But I'm like, this was beyond that because, I mean, to be honest, I don't think it was a Satan problem. Like, I think, you know, he had some heart in it. But I'm like, there is something wrong. It's here. you, like, yeah. Like, yeah, I can pray for Satan, but like, there, I, I have to put the action in, and I'm just struggling so hard, like beyond just getting attacked. And so I knew, I'm like. Please, I'm like, Lord, what is happening? I would even think, I'm like, I know the Lord said to do this, and I want to do it, but yet I'm not doing it. Like, so why am I not doing this? Like, what is wrong? Like, why am I being so reluctant to being obedient to you? Like, it should not be, yeah. like, this hard because it's not just an attack. Like, it's something mentally for me that I was struggling with that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And, like, I almost didn't even come here today because I was going to, like, hang out with a friend, but... Last minute one, I was just felt so physically exhausted for the past few days. But also, like, the Lord was just, I just had this feeling like I should just cancel. Like, just don't, just go together. Like, don't go there. Like, it's fine. You're okay. And so I did. And I'm, I'm so glad. Because, like, 
this, I have been waiting for this understanding and figure out where the root was because I knew like, I, I've been saying like, oh, it's a mental thing, but I didn't understand where the mental part was coming from. So I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to figure this out finally. It's not to address it. Exactly. And I love what you just said because I just triggered something I want to say, but I forgot. Um, yeah, there's some things we pray for, right? And we should be praying daily. So that goes without saying. But there's some things you got to do. And you can't depend on what a prayer ain't coming through yet, so that's why I didn't do it. You're going to end up in a place you don't want to end up. And that's the best way I can put that. It comes a point where you say, enough is enough. Let me make myself get to this point where I'm doing what I should do. You don't pray to make sure you get up every day and brush your teeth. You don't pray to make sure you make sure you cleanse your body and feed yourself. So at a certain point, you gotta move past prayer and, and start making certain initiatives to do what you should be doing that you're not doing. I don't know how else to word that. There are things in my life I wasn't doing and this whole situation of where we're getting on reverence, my level of, my measure of respect for him, my measure of obedience, it gets to a point where the Lord literally will get to a place and say, I don't care. Do it or don't do it, I'm moving on. And we gotta understand, like, I'm literally at a place where it's just like, when he says to do something, even if you don't know how to do it, don't understand how to do it, may not have seen the vision completely yet, do it. You can't depend on other people to get you through. You can't depend on this person's prayers to get you through. You have to do what he said to do. And that's the best way I can put it. We all going through this. So trust me, I understand where everybody at, but I can't stop at prayer and be like, well, once I feel the strength come through, that's when I'm gonna do it. Then I'm gonna be in complete disobedience to God and when I need help, he's not gonna be able to help me to wait. I gotta make sure I'm making certain initiatives every day. Okay, you said do this, let me put this on my schedule. If, if you gotta create a, a schedule, a calendar, I don't care, do what you gotta do, but to not do what he told you to do, God is saying it's not acceptable. And it's all directly tied to the measure of the reverence we have. Because when we have a certain reverence, you put things aside. And we, we've said this a lot in the ministry. People are gonna do what they wanna do. So if you're doing what you want to do, it's because you wanted to do it. And if you're not doing certain things that the Lord told you to do, it's because you don't want to do it. And there's a submission, a uh, respect level problem issue. The last thing, but like when it came to being obedient to the Lord, I will always like try to come up with something that can like encourage me, whatever. Like, oh, I'm doing it for AJ or I'm doing it as a challenge or I'm doing this or whatever. And it was all just temporary. So, and I was like, I'm tired of doing stuff temporarily. I want to find something that's gonna like keep me long term engaged. Like I know, you know, it comes to a point where I have to just do it because I just need to do it. But like, like something that I could just always look to, and all the other stuff was like just super temporary. And, like something is wrong. Like I should not need a temporary yeah. thing to get me started. And so like now it's like you know, I'm forever gonna be respect the Lord. Um, and I don't know. I just well, I found a new hope pretty much and a lot of encouragement and knowing like that this is where the problem centered and like to not, I don't have to look for these short term things to try to get me going or whatever. Like I, yeah. can, I can address it from the root and start having actual progress. So. Yeah, exactly. No, this is really good. <laughs> this lesson has been very powerful. Uh, last week was really good and this week is uh, very good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know how to word this and I may word it wrong. It's scattered in my brain. I'm gonna get it out. I'll try to clean it up. If you think that you praying for God to increase your measure of respect for him, 
is what's going to cause you to grow your reverence for him? No. Yes, pray for everything. But that's not how that's going to happen. It's on you to stay before him, to learn him, to change your ways, to change your thoughts, to change your value system. Those things are on you. And I think a lot of times we just want to pray stuff into our lives and not do the work that it requires to get there. My, my measure of respect for God grew the more, the closer I got to him, the more I studied his word, the more I understood him, the more I started to see things his way. Then I started to change my value system. Then I started to change the, my perspective. Perspective, I always say that because that's what God says to me. Perspective has a lot to do with things. Um, and so that's on you to do those things. Prayer in and of itself is not going to do those things. And I don't have a good grasp on this, but what I'm sensing and what the Lord is putting in me is that certain people are thinking, all I need to do is just pray and then eventually that measure of, of reverence is gonna grow. You're gonna be where you are today if that's where you're gonna leave it today. There are things that you have to now do. There are efforts and initiatives that you have to now do as we're all learning, hey, I need to grow in my reverence. And that should be every one of us because I don't think anybody has reached a pinnacle of your reverence being where it needs to be. That's me too. I got to grow in that too. So it's a daily thing of growing that, growing closer to him, recalibrating your perspective, your thoughts, all these different things. So um, that's a journey we all going to have to take. Okay, so as I was stating, therefore, the fear or reverence or deep respect of God in you, that's what produces a submission to God. And out of the submission, the measure of anointing is going to flow from you. And here's the thing about anointing. Anointing is what we're talking to in the perspective of winning battles, all battles. We should be winning all spiritual battles. The anointing destroys the yoke. So I go back to this. There's no reason why saints should be losing. But as we get more in detail, we're starting to see why saints are losing. One, the repentance isn't there. That's about 80% of you winning the battle. But the uh, another 10% to that 80, that gives us 90, is worship. Which has to do with your level of reverence, which has to do with your measure, which let me say that measure, it has to do with your measure of reverence in God, which has to do with your measure is directly tied to your measure of submission to God. And that submission to God, that measure is directly tied to the measure of anointing you flow in. And the anointing is what destroys yokes, y'all. So let's look at that in scripture. I'm going to go in Isaiah to chapter 10, verse 27 and stay in the New King James Version. Isaiah 10 and 27 in the New King James Version. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. And that says oil. KJV says because of the anointing. So, it is the anointing that destroys the yoke that the enemy wants to place around your neck and, and around your life to steer and lead you to places that is taking you off the path that God would have for you. So we need measures of that anointing flowing in our life to destroy these yokes that the enemy wants to try to bring to us and put on us, especially in battle. But the measure of anointing you operate in is directly tied to the measure of your submission to God. But the measure of your submission to God is directly tied to the measure of your reverence for God, how much you value him, how much you respect him, how much you esteem him, how much you favor him. And when we say him, it's him, his word, his ways, his principles, his rules. It's all of that. 
So let me pause. Are there any thoughts, questions, or comments on that? Can you just repeat the phrase again? Yes. The after the your obedience is in relation to your okay that God. the chain reaction. Yes. Okay. So, so I like know what I said. Um, so I think what I said was so I was talking about how the anointing. The measure of our anointing is very important because that's what's going to destroy yokes. But the measure of your anointing is directly tied to the measure of your submission to God, which is your obedience. But the measure of your submission is directly tied to the measure of your reverence for God. So if the reverence isn't there like it needs to be, the submission isn't going to be there like it needs to be, which means the anointing is not going to be there like it needs to be. Which means that yoke is going to be in place. And that's going to be hard to win a battle with a yoke around you. Okay. Thoughts, questions, or comments on that? Okay. So what I'm going to do... Um, I'll say a few more things. I'm not going to get into um, number two yet, which is the attitude. Um, we got a, a, a lot to review on attitude. Number three is going to be the atmosphere because I know Andrew asked what do I mean by atmosphere. So that's still to come. So we'll be talking about that. Um, and I'm, Donovan, I'm going to probably need about another Sunday or two to finish this before you come back and teach because um, I just want to make sure I finish this. So I'm halfway through this lesson. That way we can finish this out and Donovan will come back in about another week or two and go back to framework of discipleship. So... Um, I think what we're all starting to see is that there are places in our lives that we need to build up, right? Um, to be able to win spiritual battles. Um, and y'all, this reverence piece, the submission, like all it is has to do with what we're talking about falls under, under the category of worship. And I think that's very important because as we're seeing today, people claim to worship God, but you can't worship God properly if the reverence isn't there. Because if you're not reverencing God to the measure you should, the measure of your submission is not going to be there, which means the measure of anointing is not going to be there. And as we're looking at worship is going to be the foundation for the anointing the attitude you should have and the atmosphere that you place yourself in. So, I mean, I'm gonna just leave it there before I open it up. I'll open it up for last thoughts, questions or comments and we'll pray out. Um, but just let that sink in. If you need to re-listen to this lesson again, we'll continue next Sunday with this. Hopefully I can wrap this up next Sunday or the Sunday after. Just depends because I'm not rushing this. Um, this has been a very, very powerful lesson. Um, and I want to make sure we're getting what we need to get from this as we, you know, fight these battles that's coming our way. So any last thoughts, questions, or comments? Can you just define the anointing? Yes. So the anointing is basically the power of God, which we get through the Holy Spirit. So, um, a good scripture to look at for that would be Acts 10, is it 38? And it says here, Acts 10, 38, and the New King James says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So, the anointing comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit which gives us power. So while everyone that is a saint has been born again, meaning they experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes with the sign of speaking with tongues and they have power in them, it doesn't mean that you operate in great measures of that power and that anointing. That increases as your reverence and submission to God increases. And so... When I look at people and they're like, I'm Holy Ghost field, blah, 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 blah. But you're not winning though. 
So what good is it to have power and you not win it? And what good is it to have power if you don't increase the measure that you can operate in that power? Which can only happen through your reverence, which leads to your submission, which leads to greater measures of anointing. Y'all, it's all connected. And I love how God has it all connected because you ain't going to get nowhere with him until you hit the first step. And then when you hit the first step, hit the second one. And you can't just hit it and let it decline. You got you to gotta play manager. You got to make sure you're managing to make sure these areas in your life and components are, are, are not decreasing. Which means we have to do daily maintenance in our relationship with God. Just like you would have to do daily maintenance in your marriage or in a friendship or in anything. You can't just put it on autopilot and walk away and do whatever you want to do. And I think too many people are trying to be on autopilot and your plane is 30 degrees off course and you don't even realize it. All right. If nothing else, I will go ahead and pray out. No class on tomorrow for Bible class on Monday because it's Memorial Day. So we'll be back next Sunday. I'll continue teaching this. And then we'll have Bible class next Monday. So Father, Lord God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this class. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord God. We just thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, just for giving revelation, Lord God, um, to those that needed to just get some answers that they have been searching for, seeking for. Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that we all take up the mantle and, um, you know, show us what we need to be doing, Lord God, and things that we can incorporate in our lives to increase the measure of reverence that we have for you so that our measure of submission will increase and the measure of the anointing that we flow in um, will increase, Lord God. Um, I don't think any of us desire, Lord God, to be low measure saints. I think we all want to be high measure saints, Lord God. So, Lord God, um, open up our revelation. Open up our understanding. Show us where we're going wrong, Lord God. Uh, correct us. That's what I'm going to pray for. I pray for correction, Lord God. Um, I think a lot of us are coming to a realization that we aren't right. So, correct that. Show us where we're going wrong and what needs to be done and how consistently it needs to be done so that that journey can begin um, so that a year from now we're not where we are today but we're further along that road operating in greater measures i pray that every student will have a blessed uh, memorial weekend holiday um, and that we have a safe holiday um, and so lord god until we reconvene we love you and we thank you for all these things in jesus name amen